Yes, so are ju all judges ready? Okay. Okay, the first one, please start your speech. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kali, and I have to apologize that uh, I don't know I could get in the final competition. So I just finished my barbecue. There might be some oil in my face. I hope you guys don't mind. And now, anyways, I want to first ask you guys a question before I start my speech. Do you have any friends of American-born Chinese or say ABCs? Not so many, right? Even though I cannot see your faces, but I kind of guess that answer will be, you could just count them over into your one hand, right? And now here comes another question. How do you think of them? What kind of characteristics you will give to describe them? Rich, arrogant, people who enjoy privilege from both countries. Um, I don't know, people who have high social status. Well, sorry for mentioning all the biases term, but these were all true among people decades ago. As you can see, stereotypical answers might vary among people. But as I know at least, my friends won't see them with these characteristics because I myself is a Chinese American. Well, strictly speaking, I'm not. Um, I don't regard myself as Chinese Americans because I, born, I, I was raised in Chinese for all of my ages and I speak Vietnamese and Chinese as my first language. Anyways, um, what I want to point out here is that, please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that people who are getting along well with Chinese Americans will not voice out these kind of biases because they're afraid to do so. But what I want to mention here is that the less attachment you have with the minor group, the less understandable they seem to the majority or to you in a comprehensive way. Now, this theory applies to almost everything, right? Um, for example, um, maybe the less attachment you have to math or science, the more likely you will screw up on your exam, right? of course it is less understandable to you. So under such condition, Chinese Americans are facing various type of stereotypes over time. And I remember there was once a term called model minority myth. And I'm sure most of you guys have heard about it. I'm not sure. Um, it is a pure stereotypical and um, stereotypical generalization of Asian people, ascribing them with wealth intelligence, diligence, and law-abidingness. Now, for those of you who intense or who, who, who do not know about it, may ask, these are all decent characteristics and adjectives. How could it be a um, stereotypes term that might hurt a particular group feelings? Well, in psychology, as a matter of fact, stereotypes could be positive as well, even accurate sometimes. Well, this one though, still causes great negative outcomes over Asian people. According to Tae Yong Kim, a doctoral candidate in the University of Notre Dame, she believes that model minority myth places high expect expectations on Asian people, leading them to such condition of self-doubt, inadequacy, psychological problems, and even suicidality. Why so severe? Reasons are as follows. Firstly, regarded as perpetual foreigners, Asian Americans are perceived as less American than the other races, which causes ABC, especially, to report a greater anger over their endorsers because they identify such a term as a microaggression. Secondly, for those who do not fit the stereotype term, for example, those really do not good at math and science as expected, are categorized under this one umbrella as well leading them to self-doubt and being discouraged to seek for mental health therapy. Lastly, the last group is the one that really fit the stereotypes term, and I want to describe them with a quote by Yang, a director of National Advocacy Group. She said, it's like you're supposed to be performing well so you don't need help, so then when you really need the help, you feel like you cannot go and ask. Also, factors like cultural stigma, language barriers, and even uh, like health insurance reasons hinder Asian Americans from accessing mental health therapy. Imagine this, 
and a b c got mentally ill and he or she will refuse to see a doctor because he's afraid of being thought as a crazy man which is a cultural stigma right and he maybe he was afraid of cannot communicate well with psychiatrists fluently well his condition will just get worse and worse day by day what a vicious cycle while learning AP psychology, I also found that stereotypes will not cause great harm over a short run. However, suppressing our voice among stereotypes might lead to a more devastating result called discrimination. Now, discrimination is not as positive as stereotype might be. And here is a recent published news in the New York Times that really shocks me. Its title is Spit on, Yelled at, Attacked. Chinese Americans fear for their safety. It basically describes a Chinese student called Yuan Yuan walking on the street in the United States normally and then being insulted verbally and physically by the local people. And here is a sentence in it. She could really feel him staring at her and then suddenly she fell at his saliva hitting her face and a favorite sweater. And then I write it to my mom later What's more surprised to me is her remarks. She's like, she's like, this is normal. Your, your aunties and uncles are always sharing this kind of articles in your family WeChat group and I'm just too busy checking them out. And then I was like, wait a minute. When does this kind of discrimination becomes a normal thing that at least in views of ordinary people like my parents? And the more I research on the topic while preparation, the more report about it emerged on my webpage. The new data says, Asian Americans report over 650 racist acts over last week, March 27, 2020, just a few weeks ago. And all of the cases are under the explosion of coronavirus. It's not difficult for us to imagine a virus to be the blasting fuse of dislike and hatred. However, it will never be a reasonable factor of crossing it over into discrimination. Under such condition, Chinese American especially are unable to fight back under such condition. So some of them try to come back China where their parents are from. However, at this time though, some netizens who often surf on the internet start attacking them as well, urging them to leave due to their self-interest of safety. Well, I have, I have to admit that China is doing a great project on the co fighting against COVID-19. So while there are no rights for international students and job seekers globally, and Chinese Americans come by their hometown for a better security and to do appropriate quarantine, this is for me another kind of discrimination as well. Now, you might ask, why do I need to care about it? Um, I am not Asian Americans and they are not me. And why is it important to us? My answers will be because discrimination might happen on everyone. And I'm just mentioning the tip of the iceberg where I was a part of it. Throughout the history, as my favorite um, psychological teacher, Hank Green said, we have amplified for segregation of Southern African and Nazis for Jewish and centuries of bloodshed between Catholics and Protestants. These are all extreme examples of violent prejudice, in other words, discrimination. Nowadays, we are still facing discrimination over sex, race, age, and even love. And for those of you who intend to be international students in the future, my face the same kind of discrimination the Asian Americans face today. So I'm here to call for you, call for your attention of it, to call for you to speak up, though on the internet, when facing stereotypes, term that makes you uncomfortable and prevent them from transferring into discrimination. As John Lewis, a US politician said, we need someone who will stand up and speak up and speak out for people who need help, for people who are being discriminated against. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white, 
Latino, Asian, or Native Americans. It doesn't matter whether you're straight or gay, Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. Thank you for your listening. And the second speaker. <clears throat> Hello. Yeah, okay. Okay. Here. I'm going to start now. How is everyone? My name is Julie Xie, and I'm excited to present to you my speech. Think of the last time you saw species or any living organism. And I know it's hard, especially since we've all been staying home these days. One of my first encounters with an animal was definitely one to remember. I was a youthful child, trekking the woods behind my house. The six o'clock sky illuminated in vivid hues of blues and pinks. With every step followed a gentle crunch beneath my feet. The autumn leaves crowded every inch of the ground. I looked up and saw an endless array of oak trees, intertwined branches, forming a canopy against the darkening sky. It was a satisfying night. I was content that no one was watching me. I was at ease. Suddenly, I heard a rustle. I stopped walking to avoid what was becoming a deafening crunch. Someone was watching me. Quickly turning around to catch the eavesdropper, I was disappointed to see nothing. I shrugged and continued. Then wooing echoed through the woods. Once again, I turned around. Growing impatient, I crossed my arms and perused through the woods, carefully eyeing each tree. Two giant eyeballs emerged and glared at me. Shocked to the core, I ran home screaming as the eyeballs wooed away. Later did I learn what camouflage is. I learned that the owl I did not see was camouflaged with its surroundings. And even later, I learned that camouflage is merely one of the ways that scientists have identified how different species adapt to their environment. Scientists also look at fossil evidence, homologous structures, biogeography, embryological development, and DNA. All of these show evidence of how species have changed adapting to one's environment it is a process of evolution. Evolution is the change in a population over time. Charles Darwin's visit to the Galapagos Islands, he was able to notice key elements of a species location, origins, and age. There are many types of evolution, like divergent and convergent evolution. Divergent means sim species have similar structures but diverged over time, while convergent means different species have similar structures from sharing similar environments. But why is this important? It's important because for thousands of years, species have evolved and so have humans. We know that because our early ancestors look nothing like us now. As long as we have an environment, humans and species will change for the better. But what happens when this environment erodes or becomes a bad influence? Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have increased from 300 parts per million to 420 parts per million. To put this in perspective, for a millennia, the numbers have maintained below 300 parts. Global temperatures have risen on average 1.62 Fahrenheit since the 19th century. Ocean temperatures have risen with the top 700 meters, warming more than 0 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit since 1969. Ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica have lost an average of 286 billion tons per year. Sea levels have risen on average 8 inches. The last two decades have doubled the last century. I could go on. This is what happens. So why should we care? Many around us cannot see the detriments in the impacts, but there are people living in regions where they cannot sustain themselves because they suffer these changes daily. Because they weren't lucky enough to be born into big houses 
in private schools. Fathers and mothers are working equally hard trying to give those children food throughout the year. They are working equally hard, yet they have to face the harsh realities of handing their children only a handful of rice because of droughts. Suffice to say, I wasn't much of a climate change activist initially. Like other climate change skeptics, I chose the easy way of dealing with the situation, to ignore it. One would say climate change is a natural process, not one for mankind. But I quickly changed my mind after a trip back to the woods I saw the owl in. Except this time, there were no more woods and certainly no more owls. The fruitful forests and rampaging rivers where I would spend most of my childhood was axed away, replaced by a large commercial center. This is evidence of human created infrastructure that has taken over mother nature. This isn't just one forest and one owl. Take for instance, human caused pollutants in the ocean, chemical runoffs harm marine animals, and endangered species causing bioaccumulation, the growth of chemicals in an organism. Over time, organisms consume each other at each level of the trophic food web and chemicals spread, eventually harming the top of the food web, the bigger animals that sustain an ecosystem. What will our future human evolution look like? As people with abundant resources to fuel our economy and agriculture, we cannot simply take, and we cannot live in fear. Change in any circumstance is inevitable. How we deal with change can impact not just us, but generations ahead. It is only fair we treat the nature that has given us everything with care and responsibility. We cannot live in the selfish past. Climate change calls for a change in mindset. The reason why some people choose to ignore climate change is because it's a gradual change that doesn't directly impact them. Setting aside issues is easy, especially if it has nothing to do with you. But don't we feel a sense of responsibility won't we feel security to know that every individual has put in effort and won't we die in dignity once we have tried our best and accomplished everything we can do? This is a time of collaboration. Conflict does not resolve issues, especially fatal issues that can impact us tremendously because we did take precautions earlier. No matter what belief, religions, political views, people. People need to come together to face this global issue. Because in the end, we all came from the same family and are global inhabitants of an ephemeral earth. We need solutions. So whether you agree or disagree with the cause of climate change, we must all take part in creating solutions because we know the situation is a fact. Over the past summer, I spent a couple of days planning for an event in Shanghai. I was part of an organization whose goal is to help inform young students about the detriments of climate change and teach them how to act as a responsible citizen. The actual event took place in a day. We engaged in activities to teach them the effects of air and water pollution, deforestation, and the loss of marine life due to global warming. Here is how it changed my outlook on the situation. I saw the children in front of me. <clears throat> I saw my life ahead of me. I saw the privilege that I have that many may not have in the future, and I realized the need for effective solutions to take care of our home. Some things do not come around ever again. I can live my life and then leave with no purpose, or I can contribute. I don't have to be alive to know the good I'm doing for others, and I certainly don't have to be alive to be remembered as a responsible citizen. Imagine if everyone in the world came together to solve this issue. So what can you do to be part of a global cause? You can install solar panels or opt for fuel efficient cars. Cheaper yet equally valuable methods are saving water, recycling, using LED light bulbs, buying energy efficient products, planting trees. On a larger scale, I hope nations can adapt and mitigate. 
adaptation is adjusting to expected climate change by reducing people's vulnerability to its harms. Longer growing seasons, increasing yields, and resilient crops are methods of adaptation. Mitigation is a method to reduce climate change by lessening greenhouse gases. For example, reducing the burning of fossil fuels or enhancing oceans and forests. I learned that it doesn't take a nation to make a change. It takes caring, enthusiastic individuals willing to work for a healthier, more responsible lifestyle for the future generation, and most certainly for a better human evolution. Thank you. And the next speaker Okay, um, hello, my name is Li Jingxuan and I'm from Beijing National Day School. Today I'm going to talk about cyber violence. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk. With the fast development of technology and uh, new media, the world granted us this mic of free speech. Once voiceless people realize they have a voice, and when they unite, they have a voice loud enough to speak up to the injustice of this world, to say the truth, and to be powerful. This is the bright side of social media. But every coin has two sides, and today, let's take a tour to the dark side, cyber violence. The first time I came across this was two years ago when my friend Lucy introduced this social media platform called Weibo to me a platform where people communicate the latest news. I remember on the first day of my download, I saw this video. A 13-year-old boy made a funny face to a woman in the swimming pool. Then shockingly, get this, this woman yelled at that boy and then this woman's husband punched the boy and pushed the boy's head underwater. I was furious after watching that video. What did the boy do to deserve this? I thought to myself, these lunatics. Then I rolled down the comment section and I saw everyone furious, just like me. They wrote comments like, oh, he's a textbook monster. How could he do such thing to a 13 year old boy? Others wrote, she's just a spoiled bitch who couldn't even take a joke from a child. I agreed with all those comments, and I even wrote one myself. I wrote, I hope they all get pushed into the swimming pool. Then I hit sent, like shooting a bullet of justice. I felt good. I felt approved. I felt like I was punishing the bad guy, living Captain American. However, a few weeks later, under the pressure of social media, um, this woman that yelled, at that boy, she said to her family, she's going out to take a walk. And she went downstairs, went in her car, and she swallowed 500 sleeping pills. She committed suicide. I remember reading this in an afternoon when I was coming back from school at that moment. I was shocked, stunned, and I was ashamed. How much pain this woman must have been in to swallow 500 pills without stopping, to give out her precious life without hesitating. The coin suddenly flipped. It flipped from sympathizing this little boy into destroying a person's life. People flipped. They flipped from a group of voiceless people uniting and standing up to a pack of wolves grazing on an escape goat that is out of luck. They get her, they skin her, they tear her into pieces. I was quiet for, for a few days thinking about this devastating result. This woman, she yelled, then she was condemned to her death. Of course, yelling is bad, but death is such a horrible penalty. 
Then I realized this is what happens when a power so big be put in a group so large and price so low to pay a tyranny of majority form and condemn this woman into such an injustice result. This consequence is devilish. You can see we're human. I'm not devil. I'm not demon. We're just misused by power. I just, I was just misleaded by my anger. So I believe I can change and everyone else can change. How to change? Here I propose two ways we can change. First, step back and think to ourselves. Do we know the truth? Because more often than not, we don't. And when we don't know the truth, we should stop pressing that send because we're going to hurt innocent people, obviously. Going back to my example, after this woman, she died, people went in and digged deeper into this case. They found that this 13-year-old boy, he wasn't innocent. He kicked and touched this woman's hip inappropriately at first. Then for revenge, he and his family tracked this woman down and beat her up. After that, he and his family leaked this woman's personal information, her work information out and petitioned her to be fired. This is why she had nervous breakdown. This is why she committed suicide. Now we know the truth. We know the whole story. Criticizers shift. They say, we're sorry. We're so sorry. Oh, we misunderstood you. You're a victim too. Okay, then I feel sorry for you. But what are the use? This woman, she's dead. Her husband leaning, kneeling against her deathbed, begging her, please don't go. Please don't leave me pleading the nurse, just let me have these last moments with her. Please don't take her away. But her eyes is closed for eternity. She can come back. All she heard was spoiled. Couldn't even take a joke. She couldn't hear people apologizing. The damages are done. Let's not make that happen again. Let's stop pressing that sin before we know the truth. Let's stay ourselves in the noisy crowd. Hear the voice of both sides. Try our best to seek the hidden truth. And before that, let's not rage over things that we don't even understand. Because we shouldn't aim for apologizing for the misaccused. We should aim for stopping and waiting Stop the fight, the curse, the abuse. Wait for the fact, the truth, the justice. This is the first step, to step back. The second step is to forgive and tolerate. Um, a few days earlier, I went back to that example, uh, uh, went back to that video, and I expected people remorsing and reflecting their behavior, but they're not. They turned their target to this 13-year-old boy. They're saying, you are a rapist. Your mother committed a crime for giving birth to you. These hurtful, discriminating, humiliating words, he shouldn't deserve that. No one should deserve that. Let's leave the punishment to law and give people chances to change. Because we should know we're not superheroes and supervillains, Captain Americans and Thanos. We're human and we make mistakes and we need to be forgiven and change for the better. Let's forgive and tolerate because those irresponsible, malicious comments, they hurt people for life and that's not a 13-year-old boy should deserve. Remember at the beginning of my speech, I said the world granted us this mic of free speech. Let's use our mic properly. Let's be responsible. 
Let's flip the coin back to bright. Let's restrict our behavior with legal and moral consciousness. Let's not wear the mask of compassionate and justice while conducting incompassionate and injustice act. Let's stop the violence. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker. Can I start? Yeah. Okay. My time starts now. Children's cartoons should not be confusing. Elmo, the red and furry thing. What creature is he? I mean, Dora the Explorer, the little girl with her monkey. Where are her parents? Oh, and Phineas and Ferb. No confusion there. The two boys, Phineas and Ferb, were my childhood memories. And they created abundant scientific inventions with them. Worrying about the consequences. At the end of each episode, they are happy, their parents are happy, everybody's happy. Happily ever after. Yet in real life, we might somehow be the opposite. We tend to worry about every consequence of our actions when most of the time, it didn't even happen. And there's a study to prove it. Cited by Don Joseph Goway, the author of The Bestseller, The End of Stress, mentions a study in which subjects were asked to write down their worries over an extended period of time. As for the results, 87% of the respondents reported that what they worried didn't actually happen. And what does that mean? Our beliefs about worrying is just nothing more than a fearful mind punishing us with exaggerations and assumptions. Thus, worrying does not take away tomorrow's troubles. And what it does take away is today's peace and happiness. And that is my primary concern. I believe that the act of over-worrying has now blinded us the bright future that we used to behold. Therefore, today, we'll examine this issue of over-worrying by first seeing why we impose negative assumptions about our future, and secondly, the consequences for us to do so, and thirdly, what we should do to worry less. I mean, even in children's cartoons, we can still see cartoon characters which worry so much Elsa from Frozen. She was petrified if she did something wrong and worried about her uncontrollable powers. When she first lets it go, I mean, of course, there, there were some consequences. Yet over time, she slowly gained power over her gifts. Switching back to real life. When we, as people, encounter uncertainty, we tend to imagine every what, if, and how we might handle it. And unfortunately, we don't have ultimate control over life. And sometimes when we worry, things didn't really happen. Just like what Mark Twain once said. I'm an old man who knew great and many troubles. Yet most of them never actually happened. Which leaves us questioning then, why exactly do I worry then? According to Seth Gillian, the psychology professor at the University of Pennsylvania, provides two reasons for us to do so. Firstly, we believe that if I worry, I'll never have a bad surprise. I mean, nobody likes to be blindsided by bad news. So we might worry to preempt disappointment. Yet unfortunately, we can't foresee everything that is going to happen in life. So it is impossible to avoid disappointments. Yet at the meantime, how much are we actually suffering by fearing the future? As a high school freshman, I did worry, and so did my peers. Some people worried about their future career, or future majors, and even one said, how many babies I'm gonna have in the future? Okay, you worry. And secondly, Professor Julianne said that our beliefs about worrying tends to have a superstitious element in which we believe that the act of over worrying somehow decreases the likelihood of a undesired outcome. 
which means that we believe that if I stop worrying, then I'll be inviting trouble. Yet, if we don't stop worrying and test it out, we don't know if that's true or not. And next, there are of too much undesirable outcomes on our health when we worry, as it increases our cortisol levels. And an increase in cortisol levels can cause multiple consequences, as research has shown a positive correlation with the cortisol levels, with osteoporosis, heart disease, and more over. And the increase in stress levels caused by overworking can lead to depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and by worst, suicide. Tick tock. About 3,000 people die daily around the world by suicide. You don't have time to worry and think. We need to try and do. How do we do? Start from yourself. Start from ourself, which leads to our solutions. As provided by the former president of the British Psychological Society, Graham Davy, provides several steps that we could take. Firstly, it is a simple set, change of mindset, as we need to embrace uncertainty. It is a fact of life. We can't control it. Then our mindset actually controls our whole thing. And next, write down our worries on a piece of paper as what if questions, and then transform them into how do I questions. In order to understand and solve our worries, it is imperative to know what exactly they are. So writing them down as what if questions makes us know what our worries are. And transforming them into how do I questions tries to solve our issues. Try keeping a worry diary. Write down each time one worry occurs. One simple sentence will do. Therefore, all in all, just like Phineas and Ferb, we have to accept uncertainty. And it is a simple fact of life and we can't control it. And about the things that we worry, it either we don't have control over it or it didn't actually happen or even both. Worrying is just like a rocking chair. It gives us something to do, but it doesn't really get us anywhere. The less we worry, the less complicated life becomes. So why don't we just sit down, get a piece of paper and a pen, write down our worries and try to solve them. And that would be happily ever after. Thank you. Can all judges, audience, hear me, see me, all right? Yep. Okay, yeah. Hold on a second. All right. On February 28th of this year, when I was surfing on Weibo trying to find the latest updates regarding the coronavirus, something else caught my attention. The greatest Chinese swimmer, and perhaps one of the greatest athletes in Chinese history, Sun Yang, was subjected to an eight-year ban by the Court of Arbitration for Sports from Water. The next morning, Sun Yang became a top training term on Baidu, which, you know, stirred up a lot of waves. It all started with simple complaints like, oh my god, how can this even happen? Sun Yang didn't dope. Like millions of other Chinese internet users, I too, at the moment, did not want to accept this news. Soon, everything evolved into forms of hate speech. Australians like Mac Horton, the athlete who refused to take a picture with Sun Yang on the stage, were classified as nothing but the generations of English criminals by some official blog accounts. Moreover, many we medias, news broadcasters led by individuals, started spreading slogans such as, this is a Western world's assault directed against China. Within a week, the Chinese high court released a statement to many people's surprise that explicitly criticized Sun Yang for being one, ignorant, and two, defiant. All of a sudden, the emotional tidal waves on the internet reversed their course. People started to demand an apology from Sun Yang. Many even started calling him doping king Sun, Yao Wang Sun Yang, and interrogated him, is it that hard to admit that you've doped? 
Today, when I look back at this whole event, what I see is a constant switching around in people's opinions. And this concerns me. In a digitalized age where information is becoming more fragmented and polarized, we tend to jump to conclusions too easily without realizing that our minds are being steered by the partial images we see. So let's first examine how and why we like to jump to conclusions. Then let's identify the harm of doing so on one, the individual level, and two, on the societal level. And above all, let's piece together some fragmented solutions. First, the way our brain works has a lot to do with this. Tris Dominguez of Seeker explains that stereotyping is actually something our brains are constantly unconsciously doing. But the brain initially intended stereotyping to be a way to help us interact socially in a more efficient manner. This means it is impossible for us to just remember each individual or event by specifically what he or she or it is because the world is too complex to us. Therefore, we need to put labels on everything. In creating the labels, however, our brains need to reach immediate conclusions when we see things around happening. Second, the digitalized age where everyone can literally express himself or herself freely with almost no consequences also contribute to this crisis. In the past, when we gave an opinion, we needed to worry about people's reactions around us. But today, posting hate speech regarding someone in the other hemisphere takes nothing other than a few finger taps on the keyboard. Third, the ease of becoming a media influencer and the desire to be on top trending leads some people to post first and then think about their actions later. In the past, for someone to offer news, he or she had to be bounded to a broadcast company or something. But today, literally anyone can just go online and register an account and start to broadcast, evaluate, and comment on any newsworthy event he or she sees. As a result, there's almost no review of the invalidity and bias on the, the internet. Now, think back to the Sun Yang case again. Even today, none of us know, probably, except Sun Yang himself, whether he doped or not, or whether he really smashed his blood samples or not. But one thing I'm really sure of, that is, everything presented up to us up until today, this point, is still a partial image. Now, what is the specific individual harm that is created? Let's all start by imagining a case where we are wrongly accused of doing something. Maybe you tried so hard to complete an assignment last night, but today the teacher asks, hmm, where did you plagiarize this from? This question arose simply because you did a better job than usual. Or maybe you found some money on the street and decided to give it to the policeman, but the officer asks, you stole this wallet from someone else, right? These are not extreme examples. In fact, such things happen around us every day. When such things happen, we feel wrong, we feel sad, we want to curse. Why? Because all of those people only saw the partial images. Of, well, the teacher only saw you, saw your like very nice assignment, but did not see your hard work last night. The police only saw you with someone else's wallet but did not realize that there are still random acts of kindness in this world. Now, think of cases when we wrongly accuse other people. How many times did a friend try to explain something to us that our brains keep on telling us that he or she was lying because we were so certain about the partial images we saw? This makes us more like computer algorithms than human beings. We focus more on the events instead of who the people really are. We are just so certain about the conclusions derived from the partial images that we jump to them directly without any hesitation. Our eyes are locked on this specific perspective and our minds are being pushed to the ends of the extremes. Of course, in this case, the efficiency of our judgment increases. The contrast between black and white increases. But you and I, all of us, we become dehumanized. We become computer algorithms that just ex ex execute orders without any emotions. So now, how does the harm of individual ultimately lead to the harm of the society? Well, individuals sometimes they are the victims, but sometimes they form together into bigger crowds and use their toxicity unconsciously as perpetrators. Think back to the Sun Yang case once again. Mac Horton and 
the Australians were the first ones being attacked, but then Sun Yang himself and his fans. Under attacks like this, mob mentality forms. Now, shift this whole logic from Sun Yang to common people. According to Lewandowski of the Heritage Ledger, a person commits suicide every 40 seconds around the world, which is a significant increase from 10 years ago, primarily due to the chat box function on social media. The freedom from consequences when we type in hate speeches on the keyboard does not mean the freedom from impacts to the victims. We need to start to think twice before expressing anything. Now, looking at this from another perspective, some news broadcasters and some media influencers, they actually want to see the society being steered by what they publish because more trending in today's world means more profits. But as a group collectively, we people are the ones being consumed by such news broadcasters. Who's gonna say the news is false or the news is inaccurate? If we fail to act and simply believe in whatever they publish, imagine what they can do with this. So now finally, uh, some solutions together. Well, it would be very irresponsible of me to tell you doing one, two, three will solve this problem. If this were the case, the problem would have already solved itself and I wouldn't be able to, talking about, uh, to talk about it now. A simple answer to my entire speech is that we cannot solve this crisis by any one action. So trend is that information will become more fragmented and like I've said, our minds need uh, immediate conclusions when we make judgments. But there are certain things we can do to mitigate this crisis. First, always take a step back. Well, this does not mean that we try to pretend to be blind at what's happening in front of us, but we try to search for a bigger, a more complete image. The closer we stand to something, the more universally and unquestionably correct it seems. A step back returns us our lost rationality and objectivity. If it is possible, maybe even try to go around the fragment to see what's on the other side. Second, be doubtful. We need to start asking questions. Do not just read China Daily or Wall Street Journal. Try to read both or other perspectives that are not the mainstream alternately. Many things in the world are not black or white. They can be millions of other shades of gray in between. We need to realize the fact that everything can have a bias behind it and do not make the, our brain's ability to summarize and categorize a weapon against ourselves. Next time, when you are presented a conclusion, be it a news article online or some opinions of peers, ask yourself, what's the process leading up to this conclusion? What are the facts and impacts? If after evaluation, you feel like, oh, this conclusion is so well supported, that's great. But if not, I want you to think of something, a quote written on my humanities teacher's blackboard last year. It is by a Nigerian author, Shimamanda Adichie, and I quote, the problem with stereotypes and prejudice is not that they are incorrect, but they are incomplete. Stories matter, many stories matter. In a world where information, news, opinions, and voices are proliferating faster than ever, you and I are being surrounded by more and more fragments in which right can be wrong and wrong can be right. Perhaps the only thing we can do is try to go out there and put those fragments together, put those fragmented stories together, and this will be as complete as it can get. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me and see me clearly? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start now. Robert Ingersoll once said, we rise by lifting others. Unfortunately, the opposite is also true. Mrs. Munn, my first grade teacher, holding a long stick in her hand, the next moment she used it to slap it onto my desk and scream, quote, what are you doing? Seriously, you should go and check your IQ. All of you listen, stop hanging out with her if you want to maintain your test performances. I was solving a multiplication problem in my first grade. Like seriously, seriously, my first grade from another school was still learning how to add numbers and I was already multiplying. My private school was very sport oriented. 
the school set up a system that teachers are evaluated based on students' test scores. And because of this system, teachers are being pressured to put an incredibly amount of emphasis on test scores. Over time, Mrs. Munn has successfully convinced me that I was stupid and I couldn't do great things. As a kid, the most frequent question I asked myself was, am I actually that stupid? Her voice, her words have been echoing in the deepest corner of my heart that even later I transferred to another school and became one of the top students. This feeling still bothers me. Consequently, I learned not to trust myself. I see this as a problem that each of us in our own way is an educator. We are educator in terms of parents, teachers, bosses, friends, neighbors, relatives. And as educators, some of us tend to tell others that they couldn't do certain things based on their own judgments. These judgments were made based on personal bias experiences while ignoring the severe consequences of putting someone down. I am standing here humbly to discuss about this is because I know I'm not the only one. There are so many people out there suffering from the same humiliation I have suffered. You may say that, oh, I'm not related to this directly. And you should really find yourself lucky if you don't directly relate to this. But I still want to ask you, have you ever, even once, told someone that it was impossible for them to achieve something? I think that it is possible that most of us at one time or another have been guilty of ourselves for doing it. Me personally had a friend who told me that he wanted to go to the Princeton University. And I told him it was impossible because he doesn't have perfect GPA nor perfect SAT score. And to be honest, his scores aren't even close to perfect. In my defense, Mrs. Munn had taught me to think this way. Fortunately, he was able to prove me wrong because he did get into the Princeton University. If someone put down an adult like my friend, they can probably use their life experiences to shrug it up. But young kids don't. They will remember your words and your words may make an impact. I saw the story on social media about how a 58 years old man, so remember that his sixth grade teacher told him that he couldn't act and would have to be the cameraman. 46 years later, this man still remember being humiliated by his teacher. But is this teacher a professional who can identify exactly who can and who cannot be an actor? Obviously no. There are so much possibilities in every single person, and this is why we should never try to judge someone while not knowing their full potential. Recently, I happened to come across a video myself when I was in the first grade, and in the video, I was crying desperately, saying, why only I can have friends? What have I done to become such a terrible person? My mom used to claim that I was a happy kid who always bring people around me happiness, who barely cried throughout the entire childhood. So what have they done to turn this happy kid into a desperate crying kid? We are all now stuck at home doing Zoom meetings due to the outbreak of virus. And there was one day after I took uh, the, the online class, I realized a really interesting fact that now it's harder for teachers to put me down simply because their stick can no longer reach my desk. So if even now you still find crashing someone's confidence is not a big deal, let me tell you the more severe consequences behind it. When simple put downs develops into repeating patterns, it becomes verbal abuse. Is anyone in the audience a parent? I think you should know that there is a direct effect of verbal abuse on child's brain development, and this is beyond the speed, because according to Akami Kumoto, who published a scientific research article on American National Institution of Health, who is a direct correlation between free matter of brain and verbal abuse. I also done other research which proved that the long-term effect of verbal abuse includes eating disorder, dropping out of school, mood disorder, physical aggression, PTSD, and even suicide. These impacts 
may last even until these kids enter their adulthood. So now you may ask me, what can we do to solve this problem? And I'm going to tell you, first of all, let's all get rid of the idea that verbal abuse can be used as an incentive to motivate students to work harder. This weight on motivation, in fact, is rooted deeply in the society, but has to be eradicated. There are so many school, uh, score oriented school, schools that create an unfriendly competitive environment which triggers teachers anxiety to improve students test scores but teachers shouldn't have such pressure as they have less control on students test scores there are so many other factors such as family relationship issue can also make an impact so first let's take away link teacher evaluation to test scores next according to eleanor roosevelt no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. We, as the victims of verbal abuse, should make it our responsibility to never give the consent when someone tries to put us down. As kids, we need to learn how to reach out to adults nearby for help. As adults, we should never hesitate to help these kids out when they reach out because your help may change a kid's life forever. Additionally, we as educators, as parents, should make it our job to help these kids to discover their hidden value. One way that I had overcame the trauma of verbal abuse was through doing a variety of volunteering works. I volunteer in schools, libraries, hospitals, camps, and so on. I received many, many appreciation letters throughout the year, and these appreciation letters really reminded me of my personal value to help others which turns out to boost my own confidence. Finally, we all have to realize that these put-downs don't only happen in schools. It happens everywhere in our daily life. So let's try to use positive affirmation with people around you, no matter you teach or not. Similarly, back to school, why not we praise these kids more to help them to discover and understand their infinite possibilities? Over 10 years had passed, and I think I have finally walked out of the trauma. But how many others are still suffering? How many people actually believe in the lie? I often think back, if Mrs. Munn would have known her words could create such a significant impact on a kid, would she have acted differently? Every single individual in our society is an educator. We are educator in terms of teachers, parents, bosses, friends, neighbors, relatives. Each of our words matter, and this is why we should never try to use our words to tell others that they can't. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Can you all see me and hear me? Yeah. Right, before I before the time starts and everything, I would just like to express my appreciation on the other contestants because I really like their speech and some of their points actually matches up with something that I'm about to say in my speech. So, time starts whenever. Okay, hello everyone, this is Hanson. Before I present my contentions, I would like to raise a question. Why is it important to be positive? Now, I think that's a fairly easy question to answer for positivity is what gives us hope, what gives us joy, what gives us happiness, etc. However, when we look at the other side of the question, which is why it's important to be negative, it becomes a little bit more difficult to answer because we were never really taught to be negative or we were never really taught on the good side of negativity. And that is exactly what I want to stretch today. The importance of negativity in which we often ignore lighting <laughs> okay so in my per in my personal experience that i found that there are three main ways three main kinds of negativity the first kind are the negative emotions or basically the bad the bad moves which are caused due to the adversities or the things that didn't really go that well in our lives and some emotions include like anger like sorrow like dissatisfaction etc the second kind of negativity are the negative informations or basically bad news, or the things that we don't really want to hear, but they truly exist in our world. Some examples are like climate change, like homicides, like suicide cases, all of these bad things, basically. 
And the third kind of negativity are the human behaviors in which are caused due to negativity. And each kind of these negativity that I mentioned helps us in different ways. So the first reason of why negativity is so important is because those negative emotions has the ability of helping individuals to strive for a better self. Quoting from the Atlantic side, if you feel too relaxed and happy and dreamy, you may not be all that motivated to get things done. In other words, that if we stay in our joyful zone or if we stay in our positive and comfort zone for too long and lack of negativity, then we lack of the will to endeavor. We lack of the will to pursue. We lack of the will to strive for a better self, basically. And negativity in this case is exactly the thing that promotes us. It is, it is the, exactly the thing that reminds us that we have the potential to be better and we definitely can be better. Take myself as an example. When I was eight years old, second grade, I came to the US, unable to speak English whatsoever. For such a long time that I was so confused, I was afraid, I was misunderstood, and I was completely isolated from the community. All of these negative emotions, as we can say, those anger, dissatisfaction, chagrin, all of these things accumulated inside of me. Now, these things that I just mentioned are considered as negative emotions, right? And sometimes, stereotypically, are considered as bad. However, it was precisely those sentiments that motivated me, that promoted me, that pushes me into learning English, into become a part of the community, and it successfully did. So what this means is that when we have negativity, when negative emotions are accumulated inside of us, it becomes a power, it becomes a tool, it becomes a motivation inside of us that pushes us into becoming better. I realize that a lot of people tend to dislike, suppress, or quill their negative emotions. However, I consider them as precious. I consider them as a very useful tool that can be used instead of being suppressed. And the second reason of why negativity is so important, which correlates with the other speaker, is that the world we live in is not only limited to positivity, but there is a great half of things that are happening around the world that are pretty negative. And that is exactly why we need to see both the positive side and the negative side in order to see what the world actually looks like and in order for us to actually change the world. And negativity, negative information in this case, is exactly what tells us. It is exactly what reminds us. Just take some recent cases as examples, like other contestants have mentioned. But in the US alone, 2019, that there are more than 4,000 homicide cases. At the beginning of 2020, the Australian wildfire destroyed thousands of houses, caused millions of loss, and killed one billion animals. And just a few months ago, the African locust plague had a, such a huge clash on the, uh, the African uh, crop industry and caused more than 30% of African homes to suffer from food shortages. And just right now, just at this very second, the coronavirus, the coronavirus that is affecting everyone's life caused millions of loss on the global economy and have killed thousands of people worldwide. All of these things that I just mentioned are negative, yet they are realistic and they truly exist. If we really want to solve these problems, if we want to stop the coronavirus, if we want to stop climate change, we have to realize those problems first. We have to recognize the existence of these problems in order for us to find a reasonable solution to those problems. There was one image that I saw a few months ago that I thought was pretty interesting and you probably have seen it as well. It was this image of three men standing side by side and they have little different heights of books beneath their feet that represented their knowledge or their interpretation to the world. The first man, the shortest man with the least amount of knowledge, he sees a wall, he sees a painting, he sees an illusion that has been created by someone else to tell him that the world he lives in is perfect. Everything is in perfect balance, it's all rainbows and unicorns and whatnot, all of those good things that there's nothing wrong with the world we live in. And the second man with slightly more knowledge, he sees the illusion, of course, but he sees something that is beyond the walls. He sees crossfire, he sees wars, he sees climate change, he sees homicides, he sees all of those bad things that are actually happening in the world we live in. And the third person with the most knowledge, he sees the illusion and he sees the uh, realistic world, of course, but he also sees something that the other two men never saw. He sees something bright. He sees hope. He sees solutions. He sees a potential of a brighter future. Of course, that all of us wants to be in that third phase in which we can see those problems and we can actually solve those problems. 
but we can never get to that third phase if we don't get to the second phase first. In other words, we can never actually solve those problems if we don't realize the existence of those problems. And that is why negativity is so important. That is why negative information is so important because it tells us what is wrong with the world we live in in order for us to make corrections, in order for us to make the world better. If a society overly exaggerates the importance of positivity and often ignores negativity, then it is a society made of lies. Lies to tell the citizens that everything is fine. Lies that paints that very illusion that a first man sees. Lies with the main purpose to brag of the ruler or brag of the creator of creating such a perfect utopia, such a perfect world for them to live in. And lies with the main purpose not to serve as citizens, but to maintain power. And lies that will only eventually hurt us by not telling us what is coming at us, not telling us what can hurt us. So answer the question again, why is negativity so important? Why is negative information so important? Because it reveals the truth. Because it reveals the truth of a problem in order for them to be solved or even prevented. And the third contention of why negativity is so important is because those human behaviors that are caused by negativity are the ones that kept us alive all these years and are the ones that made us as successful as we are today. Fear is a kind of negativity, right? Yet fear of death is what kept us alive. When our ancestors were still living in caves, they were chased by beasts. They ran away because they are afraid of death and they know they're gonna die if the beast ever chased them. They stopped eating some uh, particular poison food because they know those kind of food will only kill them. Our fear of death, our respect of death kept our ancestors alive and made us, made us alive all these years. I really like a quote from Steve Jobs. He says, stay hungry, stay foolish, as we all know. My interpretation on this quote of staying hungry is to have the desire of obtaining objects that can physically make our lives better. Some examples are like money, like power, like these things that actually physically makes us have the ability of having a better life. These are the things that we really want. And the second half of the sentence, which is to stay foolish, my interpretation is our desire of knowledge, our desire of a spiritual world, or in other words, curiosity. Now, hunger, foolishness, sounds negative, yet they're extremely essential. Our desire of obtaining more objects are the motivations that we have as human beings to get up and get to work and strive for a better tomorrow. Those are the things that actually pushes us because we want more power, we want more money, and that is exactly why we are striving in order for us to get that money and get that power. And this process of individu individuals fighting for, and this process of individuals fighting for a better life is the process of the revolution, evolution of human beings. And foolishness, foolishness basically sums up all scientists. All scientists, we can say that they're curious because they want to know what is happening in the world around us. They want to know how the world works. They want to know how the universe works. And that is exactly why what pushes them into having more discovery in science and eventually have more breakthroughs in technological world. Fear, negative. Hunger, negative. Foolishness, negative. Yet those are the three essential things that made us alive and made us as successful as we are today. So to answer the first question we had, well, actually the second question we had of why is being negative important? Well, being negative is important for individuals because it helps us to find a side of us that is unwilling to compromise and is willing to build a better tomorrow. Why is neg being negative important for a community? Because it tells us what is wrong and let us know and let us actually solve it. And why is being negative important for the entire human race? Because it made us alive and it made us who we are today. Thank you. Okay. Before I start, I wanna um, thank the, all the contestants and the judge for your hard work. And I'm the last speaker, hope you guys are not that tired because I think my content is very important. Okay. Okay, so my title, Now or Never, very vague. For my first time giving a dual speech competition and from the Golden Gate Bridge, I could have talked about many things, but I'm here to talk about gender equality. I know you're sitting there thinking, 
oh, you can't get more creative, can you? In one round of last week's competition, out of seven people, five girls, including me, were talking about gender equality. People think gender inequality is an issue that's now solved because too much has been said. However, too little is done. Allow me to quote from an honorable, brave woman, Emily Pankis, who once said, these not words. So I'm not here to whine and complain, and I'm not here giving an inspirational but useless speech inciting, we women are no longer slaves of men, and we demand equal rights. The men still need our all the money clean all the dishes. No, no, no. I'm here to actually propose a solution for both men and women. Firstly, education. Education is fundamental because how people are raised determines who you become. Since I was small, my brother and I were raised very differently by our parents. Every time when I put my leg up to a chair when I'm eating, my dad tells me, be like a lady. When I talk loudly in public or my shirts are untucked, my mom lowers her voice and scolds me, be like a lady. And to be clear, I'm not upset by the fact that my dad didn't want my leg up in the chair, but how he makes me feel obligated to act in a certain way just because I'm born with a vagina. This ancient and outdated stereotypes are not only being portrayed by our parents, but by the media. Today, when you walk into any toy store, you will always see the girl section shelved with Disney Princess Barbie sparkling a tiara, while the boy section stuffed with Nerf gun and lightsaber from Star Wars. When our next generation is playing with such different things since such a young age, are we framing a future where boys are the hero out saving the world while girls are waiting for boys to save them from a wicked stepmother and put a diamond crown on their head? Is this the possibly best future we can grant our children? Since so small, we girls are being brainwashed by the story of Cinderella to being beauty snow white. And is it only me that feels weird about the Snow White story? If I could talk to Snow White, I would tell her, never ever marry a creepy guy who kisses random dead girls. Why are we even teaching girls nowadays? You will live in the giant palace just because you stupidly ate a poison apple and a weird dude gets you. Meghan Markle will tell you why blending in with the royal family is not that easy. However, I have to admit there has been some progress made. We have been seeing more kids' movies like Mulan, Moana, Brave, Frozen. For the first time in history, Disney is telling our girls, you don't need a man to live in the palace. You only need a sister with magical powers. And you don't need to be an actual princess in order to be your own princess. Most of Mandela has said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Since such a young age, our society and media need to educate both girls and boys of strong female role models, no matter if it's Marie Curry or Elsa. I hope all future girls will have the choice to choose whether they want to be the hero or the princess. Okay, so way back in 1914, where women for the first time in history are protesting for the right to vote down Fifth Avenue of New York City, a journalist wrote an article. The name of the article is Feminism for men. And the first line of the article is, feminism is going to make it possible for the first time for men to be free. That sounds pretty modern for an article 100 years ago, right? Gender equality is never only about freeing the women. It's also about freeing the men. Don't exclude men from this battle of gender equality. Furthermore, never vision them as our enemy. See them as our allies. Women are here to break their shackles, not to torture the man. And to be fair, men also have shackles, right? Okay, now I'm gonna tell you about how my brother was raised. Every time my brother showed weakness or cried, either because he was accused by my mother or he simply scraped his leg, my dad would tell him, be like a real man. That felt strange to me because whenever I cried, my dad always hugged me and comforted me. Be like a real man, not be brave. Oh, it's fine, there's nothing to worry about, but be like a real man. According to a study, nine in 10 teenage boys reported facing pressure to be manly through experience of harassment, bullying, teasing, social exclusion, and physical violence. Men in our society lost their right to show weakness. While women are being praised for either being a housewife or working mom, 
men are being called weak if they decide to be a house husband. Strange, no one actually used that word. This links to my proposal for education. From a very young age, our society and media should stop brainwashing boys. They need to be tough. They need to be out there to save the world. Just like the girls, we should give boys the freedom if they want to be the hero or the princess. It is only when we give freedom to men who want to back away from the tough world, we can give freedom to women who desire to work outside home. Free the men, free the women, free us all. Last but not least, I want to talk about the government's role of how law enforcement can help the promotion of gender equality. Okay, I'll first throw you some statistics. Women earn more than 57% of undergraduate degree and 59% of all master's degree. However, global participation rate of women in parliamental parliament is only 24.1%. Women only occupy 10% of the top management level. In the top 500 top Forbes list, there's only six women, while there's seven men called David. This might make you wonder why when women have equal, even higher education than men, the women's job position is less than less when rising to the highest. Is it that women hates working? Is a woman don't work as hard as man? No. The real turning point is when women start having babies. Before children, women earn about 90% of what men earn. I'm not saying that's good enough, but mothers only earn 73% of what men earn. So, how can we fix this? So one week ago, I saw a piece of news that said, Hubei province passed on a legislation that female workers could extend maternity leave to one whole year. Wow. However, me and thousands of women in the common areas are somewhat concerned rather than grateful. We know this is passed from good intention, but the outcome might be the inverse. Solely raising paid maternity leaves for women to one whole year, while on average men only get two weeks of parental leaves, gives the connotation and sends a signal to the society that women, not men, should be the one taking care of children. Since we get one year off, we are strengthening the responsibility of mothers while dismissing the fathers. However, fathers in our generation don't want to be dismissed. Women don't become mother, people become parents. Furthermore, one year maternity leaves for women alone makes it harder for women to find jobs. Okay, now, Imagine you are an interviewer of a big company. Two applicants with the exact same ability, one male, one female. Hiring the woman means in the future you have to pay her every month for a whole year, even though she doesn't work, while hiring the men means you pay a maximum of two weeks leave. Who will you offer the job to? The answer seems clear to me. Do you know women now need to promise to the company they will not marry or have children in order to get the same opportunity as men? To achieve gender equality in workplace, the responsibility of a child need to be shared equally to fathers and mothers. Iceland, who topped the Global Gender Index in 11th year, established a way to help both men and women safely transition through the presence of a child. In Iceland, nine months of leaves will be divided between the parents was three months allocated to the mother, three months allocated to the father, and the rest of three months open for both to share. The solution effectively diminished discrimination towards women while looking for a job and create chances for father to take part in his long absence rule in the family. Government and policies need to provide a haven for both men and women to reach equality and balance in family and workplace. 2,000 years ago. During the French Revolution, monarchy was abolished. Common people like you and I gained equal rights, just like King and Aristotle. 200 years ago, African Americans got the right to vote. Students can sit in the same classroom from different racial backgrounds and learn. What about today? How many more people need to suffer in this world because of their gender? How many more boys would have no choice but to man up because the parents in society forced them to? How many more girls in India are going to be raped and not ask for help because they feel it's a sin being a woman? Gender equality is never only about rescuing half the world's population. 
but the whole population. Gender inequality is an obstacle that will never diminish unless we take action. So start today, start now. Before it's too late, now or never. Thank you very much.